I've got sound. Do I got sound? I got sound. Okay. Couldn't load that page. I can't see. Uh, click here to retry. I think I'm live. There we go. All right. Well, I am. Uh, I'm just uh, running a little bit late. Oh, I'm a minute early. Uh, okay, I hit the button a little bit too early, but that's okay. My name. Uh, welcome to Tech Talk. This is Technical Thursday. So um, today was a, bad, a rough day. I had uh, had a cooktop issue upstairs, so I had a service guy come out for that while I was on a conference call. I had uh, my HVAC went out, so my HVAC guy was here. He fixed that. And um, <laughs> so I have, uh, I wanted to do at least a little bit of preparing for today, but I wasn't able to do uh, all too much. But we are going to talk about, we're going to do a deep dive on circuit breakers. Um, very important overcurrent protective device that is probably in every, well, in many homes, because there are probably still some homes out there with fuses. Um, but, uh, from a residential perspective, there are a lot of circuit breakers out there. And from a commercial and industrial perspective, there are a lot of circuit breakers out there. So we're going to be talking about all different types of circuit breakers. So you're going to hear me say that word circuit breaker a lot. Joseph, excellent. You're the man, Joseph. You're the man. Um, all right. So we're going to be talking breakers, circuit breakers, and, Oh, it looks like I'm going live on three different platforms. And we got uh, hey, Robert from Omaha. Good to see you. Um, if it were easy, everyone would do it. Amen, brother. And I'll tell you what, today was a rough day. Um, so, but uh, I did manage to, um, I did manage to just try to, I grabbed some of the slides I've used in the past to talk, to guide our discussion. I made some notes. I don't know what I did with my notebook. So those went out the door. We got Nihad El Sharif. I know I took my tie off because we had some issues going on. So I changed my shirt and uh, mid, mid circuit breakers, mid circuit breakers, mid, mid century, mid century circuit breakers. And we got James Smith. What up in the house? So this is good. This is good. Um, I actually, you got to see my table over here. I got a bunch of goodies over here. So I got Moby Cam 1. That, this is, um, now you'll be able to see. Look at this. I got my hand over here. See that? So I've got, uh, I've got an electronic trip unit. I have my uh, circuit breaker. I did a video, and you'll see this video uh, today. But I did a video with this circuit breaker right here. Um, so I've got Moby Cam one going up and, uh, and, and all this good stuff. Microgrid interconnect device circuit breaker. Ah, I got you a mid. Why don't you just say a mid circuit breaker? Come on, Robert, man. <laughs> uh, we might talk a little bit about that if I can figure out what that is before now. And when I talk about it, uh, anyway, so, uh, some news, some good news. You guys and gals have been asking me. <laughs> I did. I know you did. That was a joke. Okay. So you got everybody's been asking me for a schedule. And then also some people have been asking me about uh, some of the files that I had. Uh, I had an arc flash uh, calculator. I had a, 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 fault, a, a, a fault current calculator, three-phase uh, fault current that did it in uh, uh, per unit. So I um, I wanted to I wanted to put something together. So last week, after I forget, I don't know how many emails I've gotten so far, and said, "Hey, what's the schedule? What are we going to be talking about? When are we going to be talking about it?" And you guys and gals, and hey, David Rodriguez in the house. Everybody knows that I've been uh, working with David Smith, and he is uh, young. I don't want to say young engineer. He's younger than me. Uh, but he's an electrical engineer as well, and he is um, very interested in getting information out. He's doing a, he's fighting the battle state by state, working with code adoption, helping the uh, IAEI and our industry partners uh, uh, carry the torch from a safety perspective in that regard. So David has been working with me to try to get some more of our product managers and product line and engineers within Eaton 
And I'm looking at uh, external people as well. So, you know, I, I like to get more people involved and have discussions uh, so that we can bring some good content uh, out there and um, knowledge to the industry. So uh, I was talking to David last week and he and I, and I told him, I says, I got to figure out a calendar and I have to figure out a way to communicate that. I'd love to do a newsletter. Uh, but, you know, when you work with a large organization like Eaton, there are you know, certain rules you have to go through and you've got to put tickets in for this and for that. And David, jokingly, I think, he says, well, why don't you just go get thomasdimitrovich.com? And I looked it up and nobody had thomasdimitrovich.com. So I got it. And so I've got that website now and I have a calendar up on that website Johnny Carson, Johnny, I've been called Johnny Carson. I've been called, um, uh, what's the other names? Uh, Howard Stern, which I'm, I'm no Howard Stern. I mean, I'm, I don't swear. We, we, we keep it nice and clean. Um, uh, I've been called, um, what's the other guy? There's a bunch of them. Uh, I've been, oh, um, Ru the Rush, uh, Rush Limbaugh. I've been called Rush Limbaugh. I don't know. I've been called a lot of names. Uh, Johnny Carson was the first one, Robert. We got Lebanon, Khalil, Khalil Baha'i. I thank you for joining in. We got Lebanon. So uh, it was interesting this morning. We had a lot of different countries. What time is it in Lebanon? Uh, we've got um, uh, Egypt online. We've got Lebanon. We've got uh, um, uh, Weirton, West Virginia, right here in the house. Uh, so anyway, I, I got a site now, thomasdimitrovich.com. And it's brand new. I just started playing with it. Um, oh, Steve Froming. Hey, Steve, you got to check out thomasdimitrovich.com. I've got a schedule up there because now I'm getting more product line people involved. Uh, let me uh, let me put it up. Oop, I'm not on my PowerPoint. So if you go to thomasdimitrovich.com, look at that. I've got an introduction. I've got a subscribe page. Where you can put now, there's two subscribe pages. One is this one, which is just like for a newsletter. But I have a resources page where if you register here, this I've got a members only register. Nothing, I don't charge for anything, so it's all free. Uh, but uh, some of the resources that I'm trying that that people are asking for are um, I I call them sensitive in that I don't want people using like one of a, a spreadsheet that I made to do a calculation on a project it's all learning so everything i put together is all educational so my thoughts are i'm going to have links up here um i thanks scott uh, i'm going to put some things up here that have resources like some, maybe some of my powerpoint slides or some videos and things like that that are members only that uh, again are controlled because i'm when you register i'll have your information and and if something changes or if there are issues i can communicate with you that's the only thing i'm using that for i just want to know who has access to it who might have a copy of it and then i can communicate any changes or uh, if you guys are using it saying hey i just looked at cell number 53 you know a 53 has an error in it and you send me back an update because this is a two-way street this isn't just a one-way street i know youtube's a one-way street but I, I, I want some interchange here. So I've got, I've got uh, this, and I, I signed up for MailChimp. So MailChimp helps me make sure that if when you say, I don't want to hear from Tom anymore, you click an opt out, and then you're done, and I don't communicate with you anymore. I think that's part of the law. <laughs> I don't know what they call it, but uh, uh, they take care of all that for me. That's sort of why I never did a newsletter in the past. And um, I was planning on trying to do, I was going to do one with, uh, with Eaton, my Eaton, uh, Marcom group. And uh, I don't know, I was just playing with this site just to create a calendar. And I mean, it was like almost free and, uh, I, it's a, it's really cool. I even, I'm playing with a message board. Um, I don't even know if it's working. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I, you know, you can play with the message board. I just threw it up there. It's and and what I'm using is called, um, WordPress. And WordPress has all these plugins that you can do. So I'm playing with stuff. And uh, you'll saw, it's four days ago, I put it up there. So I did this on Friday night and Saturday morning. So it was really quick. I put it together. But here's what I, the reason I did it was for the calendar of events. This is the only page. 
<laughs> that the only reason I even went down this road, thanks to David Smith, when he said, hey, you should go get Thomas, Dim you know, and you know how much I paid for thomasdimitrovich.com? $2.50 for the entire year. So annually, I'll be paying $2.50. And um, I did it on GoDaddy, and GoDaddy says that I can sell it for 350 bucks. So, uh, you know, go get your name, Scott Taylor. I want to see a scottaylor.com, a kahelibaha.com. I want to see a richardcurran.com. Uh, yeah, that's right. I had Jay Leno uh, because of the truck episode. Somebody called me Jay Leno. From CR, 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 CR. Cheers from CR. Help me. Costa Rica. Costa Rica in the house. Excellent. Cool beans. So check this out. And and, and I'll tell you, I've got um, uh, the Alexa dimmer switch is Tuesday. Uh, she's talking. So uh, I'm going to call her Susie. Instead of using the A word, I'm going to call it the Susie dimmer switch. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to have with me Rebecca Bitter. And Rebecca and I are going to talk about uh, this uh, switch and this type of technology we made some code changes in um in uh made some code changes in panel two for article 210 uh with regard to recognizing these this new technology so we're going to talk about some of the new code uh permissions i guess you would say uh we're, we're going to talk about those on tuesday we're going to talk about the ul listings of these things She's going to explain how they're configured and set up and how they work and talk about the technical differences because I, I, I you know, I have a system working here where I can say, not uh, Susie, but when I use her name, <clears throat> which is right up here, when I say, hey, turn on the lights, she turns on the lights, uh, whichever light I tell her to turn on. I configured it a while ago. I still can't tell you how I got it done, but I got it done. So... Uh, and 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 uh, I'm I'm you know it's it's not as um, I'm trying to make these uh, very um, my whole thought process behind the calendar was to at least you guys and gals wanted to know what I'm going to be talking about and when and here it is so uh, and and also I got the safety disconnect switch coming up on the 20th we're going to do a deep dive on the safety disconnect switch and I'm going I'm going to have uh, a very smart individual. Uh, on that one with me and application of wiring devices, selecting, installing, and maintaining. That's going to be um, uh, a very good uh, discussion. So, uh, and I'm going to have a guest on for that one as well, Ian. So Ian and I are going to have our talk about application of wiring devices. So I tell you what, so we're getting with David Smith's help, we're going to start getting um, more people engaged and involved and I might be reaching out to uh, somebody out there as well. So uh, there are a few individuals who dial in. Ah, Felix Sandoval in the house. You are the man, Felix. I'm, and I shared this with Felix. Uh, he was one of the first people I sent a link to and said, hey, can you check it out? And he was having internet problems. God, you know, that's my luck. That's <clears throat> that's okay. And that's his luck because, see, my cloud goes over other people too. Okay, so uh, that's the big, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that I will be, again, this is all, um, this is all of my spare time, but this is what I'm going to really focus on, is making sure that you have a calendar, and if you go to view more, uh, I love this, look at this app, this is so awesome, uh, you can, uh, you can see these are the ones that I had up there for the 6th and 7th, but I just did this on the 4th, I put these two events in, but we're going to, you can click on these and um, like the safety disconnect switch and you'll get, I'll put any links and whatnot uh, in here. You can add it to your calendar. Um, uh, so, and, and I've got to fill all of this out. So in any case, uh, that's uh, a resource for you and hopefully you will enjoy that. Um, and, uh, you know, and try that message board out because I, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be any good or not. Uh, I I don't know. So where, where was it? Uh, in, in resources. So check out on resources and take a look at the message board. I'm going to keep a monitor on it. I'll keep looking at it. But, um, you know, I think 
everybody can communicate with each other. So I don't know. You tell me. Just try it out. Say post a post a hello in there or something. All right. So we're going to talk about. We are going to talk about breakers, breaker basics. I love talking about breaker basics um, because, you know, circuit breakers are, they have a great history. Uh, and uh, hello, goo, 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 not trying to be a party pooper, but what is the life of a breaker for rooftop unit in general? Or in general, what is the life of a circuit breaker? James, great question. In fact, I had a slide that said, what is the lifespan of a circuit breaker? And you know what I did? I deleted it. So that's all I say about that. No, James, good question. Here's what I always say. Circuit breakers, any electrical piece of equipment, the life of it will depend upon the installation, the condition of the installation. And, 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 and here is why I say that. I'm going to show you some pictures. Okay. Um, I don't know if you could see this. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about this. Let's take a look. So I'm going to just find a, whoop, two. So look at this circuit. Now look at this picture. Okay, t you tell me, what do you think that this breaker is going to last longer or shorter? Is this breaker going to last longer or is it going to be uh, lost, la have a shorter lifespan than the one in your, in your house that's in your panel board that could be in your garage or in your basement? Mine's in my basement in an environmentally controlled condition. Okay, so the lifespan, to your point, your question was, on a rooftop unit, I would say it depends a lot on the condition of maintenance. How much maintenance are you performing on it? What are you doing to it? If you set it and forget it, it's, uh, I, I don't know, you're, you're, you, you, it's going to be a lot less because it'll depend upon the enclosure, depend upon the conditions that it's in. Um, you need to figure out what your maintenance plan is going to be for that circuit breaker. How often are you going up to the roof and turning it on and off? How often are you making sure it's clean, etc.? Does aging mechanical stress, electrical stress, ambient environment, dust, corrosion, proper installation, maintenance, Robert, all of that plays a role in the life of a circuit breaker. All of that plays a role in the life of any piece of electrical equipment. So maintenance is critical. And I can say, James, that if you are performing maintenance on that breaker, it will last you a long, long time. How many years? I don't know. Uh, I mean, I've, I I couldn't tell you that. My, my Put it this way, um, just my receptacles on the outside of this house. My receptacles, this house was built in... I think 2004. I'm gonna I'm gonna send my. What when was our house built? When was our house built? She'll tell me. Our house built. Okay, so so my outside receptacles. I have GFCI receptacles on the outside of this house. It's two 2021. I'm going. I'm gonna. Just take a guess, 2004, okay, or 2005 time frame. I think it was about the same age as I when I bought my Harley Davidson. Um, so when I replaced, when I went outside and I was um, I was doing something. Oh, I changed all my breakers in here to AFGFs. I had one of my breakers tripping on a circuit going to the backyard. Uh, arc fault, ground fault. When I say AFGF, uh, it's an arc fault, ground fault. So it's arc fault protection and ground fault protection built in. So every one of my breakers are that way. And when I put it in, it started, uh, it tripped on a circuit going uh, into the living room. So I went up and I had to take that circuit apart. So I was doing some troubleshooting. I uh, broke the circuit into parts and, and I, I established that was after a certain receptacle and on that I had the problem because when I connected 
as I connected, it extended the circuit, and then I found the problem. Well, the the wire that went outside, because it off of the living room, it went to the one receptacle outside. And I realized that was where it was uh, there where the problem was. And there was a damage. What happened was when they pulled that wire back in from the receptacle on inside of the house to the outside of the house, they boogered it up. And that's a technical term. That's a West Virginia term. Uh, they boogered it up. They 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 scraped it. It uh, cut, and it was uh, it was all it was it wasn't pretty at all. So I, when I took the receptacle out, she says two thousand and six. All right, two thousand six. So when I took the receptacle out, it was looking very bad. Now it was still working, right? Because I press the test and reset button. But when I took it out, it was to a point where I just knew I needed to replace it. It was 2006, but uh, it didn't have a good cover on it. It had an old cover that was not uh, uh, covering it correctly. Uh, it has one of the, it had one of those seals and the seals w uh, wasn't working correctly. So I, um, I had to, uh, I had to fix that and, and fix it, I did. Uh, so I had to replace that. I replaced it and, um, and, and got it back up and running again. I actually, I, I had to pull a new wire to it. It was so bad. And that was a pain in the rear end. Um, UV rating versus oh, yeah, weather, weather, weather resistant. How do you determine if the breaker is still functioning based on its rating? Uh, Saurabh, okay, we're going to get into that. So we're going to get into maintenance. We're going to get into troubleshooting. We're going to get into the ratings. And uh, hopefully I'm going to uh, answer all of these questions, which I'm absolutely thrilled uh, that uh, we're, getting, uh, we're getting some really good questions. Okay, so let's, um, let's just get into, um, I threw some stuff together. First thing I want to say, and I, I should say this for everything, although I am a member of NFPA, I, uh, Committees. I am not speaking on behalf of the NFPA. I am not speaking on behalf of Code Making Panels 2 or 10 or 70B, which I sit on, 78, 1078, 73, 110, 111, and any other of these documents that I sit and engage with. Uh, I, anything I see on this program is my opinion. And uh, if you don't have an opinion, I'll give you mine. All right. So uh, these are the standards that a breaker is listed to. A circuit breaker can be listed to 489 for molded case circuit breakers, or it can be listed to UL 1066, which is the standard for low voltage AC and DC power circuit breakers used in enclosures. And then you have UL 1077, which is supplementary protectors. Now, I'm not going to be talking, medium voltage stuff is on the uh, uh, IEEE uh, C. 37, I think, standard, IEEE C37, um, medium voltage breakers uh, listing. I think it's IEEE C37. Look, at this is what I love about the internet. Medium voltage, there we go, UL and CSA. I'm looking at our Eaton website. Medi oh, that's medium voltage, switch gear. Anyway, it's, a, it's, a, it's more of an IEEE document than it is a UL standard. So in any case, we're going to be talking about low voltage. Hey, Tamaki, wow, good evening. What time is it, Tamaki, in Japan? What I was going to tell you this morning, go to bed now so that you can be here. So you got to let me know, Tamaki, what time it is. Uh, Alexa, what time is it in Japan? In Japan, it's 6.23 a.m. 6.23 a.m. Tamaki, thank you for joining. You got up early. So you did go to sleep early. Okay, so um, you'll notice, you remember, there's three types of breakers we always talk about. And I could throw in four, but three primary types. Molded case circuit breakers, insulated case circuit breakers, and then power circuit breakers, right? So you have molded case is UL489. What about an insulated case circuit breaker? I don't see a standard for insulated case. I see 489 and 1077, and then 1070, 1066 is your power circuit breakers. 1077 is supplementary. IEC 60947-2, but what about an insulated case circuit breaker? There are no insulated case circuit breaker standards because 
they fall under UL 489. An insulated case circuit breaker is a molded case circuit breaker. Now we call them insulated case circuit breakers. And I think if you, if you go back in time, it's probably because somebody had a marketing idea on how to differentiate this, this new thing. All right. So you think about the molded case circuit breaker. Um, I need to just figure out where my slides are. So let's talk about a molded case circuit breaker. Where's, um, where is my molded case? There, there you go. Molded case circuit breakers range from, and, and actually a 10 amp, there are 10 amp miniature circuit. Look at this, so, so I've got miniature circuit breakers. That's that fourth category. You might hear say something, uh, it's a miniature circuit breaker. Well, what's a miniature circuit breaker? Is that, uh, what's it listed to? UL-489, it's a molded case circuit breaker. Well, what about an insulated case circuit breaker? Well, it's UL-489, it's a molded case circuit breaker. So. You have these circuit breakers that go from, uh, say, 10 amps all the way up to 2,500 amps. And <laughs> the, the dogs. And so you go up to 2,500 amps. The 25, now that's, a, these are molded case circuit breakers. And, and then in the past, you went straight from a molded case circuit breaker to a power circuit breaker. Now your power breakers, let's take a look at, um, at that. Your power circuit breakers, they go up to from 800 amps to 6,000 amps. Now a power circuit breaker is, 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 is a big boy, right? It's a big girl, it's a big boy, it's, it's a big device. Um, they don't have, they, they have a charging handle because there's a big spring mechanism. Uh, there's push buttons to turn them on and off. Uh, these devices, we've had power circuit breakers for many years, uh, heavily used in industrials. But what the industry needed at some point was they needed something that was in between a, a molded case circuit breaker and a power circuit breaker. And you know what I'm going to do? I don't know if I can do this or not, but we're gonna try it. I'm gonna try MobyCam for a second. I'm moving some breakers around. Can I do this? <laughs> I'm loving technology. You've got to love technology. And my this is my new desk. This is my new desk. There's the top of the page. I just gotta figure out where I'm at. Okay, now I need a pen. Sharpie. Um, oh, man. I've got to do it this way. So we do this. Okay, so. There we go. There's my TCC curve, right? So, um, desk, I just got to make sure I am, I am focused. There we go. Look at that. I even focused it for you. All right. So your, your standard molded case circuit breaker had a trip curve that looked like this, right? And... Uh, and we're going to talk about how this is how, how a circuit breaker uh, creates this curve, where it gets it from. But um, this is your standard molded case circuit breaker, uh, and you'll notice a lot of these older breakers they have very fat bands. Now the the next, and that would be you know again uh, these are smaller devices they've got an instantaneous. What they when you start getting up closer to the uh, service. So so I have a, a one-line diagram and, and, and say this would be a molded case circuit breaker. And then as you full, as you moved up in the power distribution system, why would I have needed to put a power circuit breaker up there close to the main would be because I needed the breaker 
to hold its contacts closed so that all of these downstream breakers take care of the issues with regard to isolating faults, selective coordination, okay? Uh, when, as you move up, oh, oh, selective coordination, motor inrush currents, the fact that, the fact that uh, this might be a, uh, this might be a 30 amp circuit breaker, this could be a 400 amp circuit breaker, and I will have multiple 400 amp circuit breakers. This can't be a 400. This power circuit breaker is probably going to be, a, I don't know, a 1200 amp breaker or, or more or a 4,000, 6,000 amp device. So I need more current for the power distribution system. Now, back in the day, he, at least here in the United States, uh, most of the equipment was your services and your power distribution systems were 208 volts. So back in the 40s, the 30s, 208 volts, average um, service was, was uh, 600 amps. Uh, lower voltages, uh, fault currents were, were uh, reasonable, and they were ungrounded systems. But what was happening was we were we were uh, mechanizing. We were we were more industrials. We were adding loads. Uh, power distribution systems were growing because loads were growing. Applications were growing. We were uh, building uh, buildings that were uh, manufacturing products, etc. And we needed larger services. And they realized at one point in the 60s that, hey, you know, uh, these ungrounded systems, because of the ungrounded nature of them, it's like the boat floating in the water. When the waves hit, the boats went flying, so the overvoltages were breaking down the uh, windings of motors, and motors were failing due to the overvoltage, due to the swings and voltage. And somebody probably down the street, Joe Schmuckatelli uh, decided to take one corner of his system, of his Delta system, and ground it through a zigzag transformer, and he created a grounded system, and he realized that, hey, I don't have these voltage fluctuations. I'm, I have a much stabler power distribution system. So then everybody started changing over to grounded systems, and then they went from 208 to 480. They wanted more voltage. And then the, because 480 volt equipment, et cetera, right? So then the 480 volt systems, uh, and they said, hey, I don't need a 1200 amp breaker. I want a 4000 amp breaker. So the service breaker sizes went larger. Now, as you move up closer to the main, I need a larger breaker, but also during fault conditions to ride through so that I don't trip the main, I need a I need a breaker that'll hold its contacts closed longer, okay? And I'm into a power circuit breaker. Well, power circuit breakers are expensive. What do I need? I need a low voltage assembly. It's a big gray box, and I need a room to handle that big gray box. I need um, uh, it, I, I, that power circuit breaker is I call it the Swiss watch of of circuit breakers because it's a very complicated device. But I need that big device. Why? To hold those contacts closed under higher fault current conditions for a longer period of time. What I needed was a trip curve that looked. I needed a trip curve that looked more like like this. Okay, I needed a delay. I needed this instantaneous over further. And in some cases, I may even have had that going on, okay? where I have a short time delay step. So what the goal was when they introduced the insulated case circuit breaker, it was to be the bridge in between a molded case circuit breaker, one of these, and the big power circuit breaker, one of these big, uh, big boys. So that's an insulated case, so the, the, your, big, your big power circuit breaker. So 
we came up with an, an intermediate device, an insulated case circuit breaker that is still a molded case circuit breaker, still listed to that standard, but it's not as expensive and it doesn't require as large of an enclosure because Robert pointed it out. You have a panel board. Yeah, like load center, load center versus panel board. Exactly discussion. But Robert, you also, if you think about, you have a, a panel board, you have a switch board, and then you have switch gear. I can put panel boards in a switch board. I can put molded case circuit breakers in a switch board and an insulated case circuit breaker in a switch board. I can't put a power circuit breaker in a switch board. Power circuit breakers go into low voltage assemblies based on listing, et cetera. So I cre we created, the industry created the insulated case circuit breaker, which basically is a beefed up molded case breaker. And what do I mean by beefed up? It's bigger. Why is it bigger? There are bigger springs. I could buy a 600 amp insulated case circuit breaker. I can buy a 600 amp molded case circuit breaker, and I can buy a 600 amp power circuit breaker. All three of those devices are 600 amps. Why would I buy one over the other? It's because where it's at in the power system and do I need an intentional delay to let all that stuff downstream, all of my breakers downstream, clear downstream faults, make sure that I don't trip on inrush currents if all of my motors start uh, when they are planning to start and what happens if they all start at the same time. All of that stuff plays a role in Providing a solution that keeps those contacts closed, provides that short time delay function, oh, provides this short time delay feature right here in the trip curve. It's all about the trip curve. Whenever, I mean, when someone talks to me about a circuit breaker or a fuse and a different class of a fuse, I'm not thinking about the physical look of a fuse. I'm thinking about the trip curve because... It's all about it's all about the trip curve. The perf this is the, the 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 time current characteristic curve is what I call the resume for a circuit breaker. It tells you how long it's going to hold its contacts closed for how for how, based upon the current that flows through it and when when it will open. So the trip curve tells you the performance of that device under uh, overload conditions, normal current flow, uh, load conditions overload and short circuit and even ground fault conditions okay so be mindful of that that so you have these three different types okay you have three different types of circuit breakers but really they're going to be a UL489 device a 1066 device for power circuit breakers a 1077 device which is a supplemental which uh, we'll talk about what a 1077 device is and then I put the now again I, I said this earlier this morning I'm not an IEC guru uh, we have those at Eaton, uh, and I am not one of them. And I got my Puppy Paul's coffee. It's delicious. Okay, so those are the standards. I've got, and I only have these two, molded case and power circuit breakers, because really there's only two. Insulated case circuit breaker is a marketing thing. Now, um, here's where I, I give you a, just sort of a circuit breaker that is assembled as an integral unit and supporting an enclosed housing. This is where you have some, and I believe I've got the insulated, I got this definition, I believe, out of the IEEE Blue Book, which is on circuit breakers. Uh, they added some definitions. You won't find a definition of an insulated case circuit breaker in any UL standard. You won't find it in, well, you're going to find it in the National Electrical Code because when we start talking about reconditioning of equipment, we put insulated case circuit breaker in there. And we also put insulated case circuit breaker in uh, NFPA 70B. I just cringe when we do that because in my, I mean, I know we all know an insulated case circuit breaker, but it's a molded case circuit breaker. Um, okay, so, and then you have your low voltage power circuit breakers. Again, the major, just think about it from a trip curve perspective. How much current am I going to let flow for how long? A molded case circuit breaker has an instantaneous. And the instantaneous is not there because of a standard. UL 489 
does not require a circuit breaker, a molded case circuit breaker, to have an instantaneous. UL 10, uh, 1077, 1066, none of these standards require a circuit breaker to have a instantaneous. Why do I put an instantaneous, which an instantaneous is uh, in that trip curve, it's that very fast for very high fault currents, it trips without any intentional delay. It's the definition, basically. The only reason I will have an instantaneous trip on a circuit breaker is to protect itself. Why is that? And we're going to talk about how it's constructed, but as we look at what's inside one of these devices, you're going to see a set of contacts, and you're going to see springs holding those contacts closed, and you have to understand that when fault currents flow, the magnetic fluxes will want to open these contacts. And there becomes a struggle with the circuit breaker to not chatter. You don't want your contacts to chatter. You don't want that. Uh, and the reason you don't want that is because as those contacts bump, my hands don't even look like they're mine. Look at that. As these contacts bump, they get dimples. And that is, uh, and the technical term that we have for that is ungood. That's ungood. So you want to make sure that when when you're when you have current flowing, those contacts are solid, connected, and then when you want it to open, they are opened. Uh, you don't want any chatter. So as the fault currents go higher, uh, uh, the magnetic fluxes will want to open that breaker. So I'll show you the inside. Uh, there are springs in there, and you'll see it. Uh, the highly mechanical device, Robert, highly mechanical device. So, um, the, um, article 100 of the national electrical code has a definition for a molded case, uh, for a, uh, molded case for, for circuit breakers. And I've got, I, I usually have my code book but I don't have my code book open. I've got my, I've got breakers out over here. I've got, I got pigtails going on. I've got circuit breakers. I even got some fuses just in case uh, somebody out there didn't know the difference between a fuse or a circuit breaker. All right. So I, I and it, I got to check. I want to just check this definition because um, this is from an older uh, presentation of mine. And there are a few definitions in here. You've got to go to the, remember part one is your low voltage, part uh, two is over a thousand volts. So go to part one for this discussion and the definition of a circuit breaker is the circuit breaker. Where is the definition of a circuit breaker? Uh, breaker, 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 one, nine, breaker, one, nine, circuit breaker. There it is. Jeez, oh, man. I can't see. A device designed to open and close a circuit by non-automatic means. You know, what do I mean by that? I'm opening and I'm closing this breaker. Okay. Non-automatic means. And uh, I can press this button and trip. All right, and then it says on a predetermined overcurrent without damage to itself when properly applied within its rating. And we're gonna talk about the ratings. So that is a circuit breaker uh, and, and it looks like it's the same. There is a fine, there is a, remember fine print notes no longer in the code. They are informational notes. The automatic opening means can be in integral, direct acting with the circuit breaker or remote from the circuit breaker. What do we mean by remote from the circuit breaker? Anybody know what we mean by remote? I could have a relay remote that trips the circuit breaker. I'm gonna go back in time. Oh, I love this thing. This device right here is one of the first time current characteristic curves of a, of a circuit breaker that I had to plot when I was, um, doing my first short circuit and coordination study back in the 80s. 
And this was in a facility. And this is called an Amptector Model 1A with LSIG. It has ground up here. It has a long time delay. And it has an instantaneous. And it has a short time delay. This is a relay. And this is an Amptector 1A model uh, LSIG Westinghouse. It's got it's got the coils in there for uh, for for voltage and currents, and um, it is just a fantastic piece of engineering that um, uh, mounts on the side of say a circuit breaker, and will uh, will will detect the current that flows through that breaker, and then uh, oh look at this. Look at this thing. Look at that. I mean, this is a work of art. There is an engineer somewhere who designed exactly how all of this flows. I mean, I just, I, I, I love this stuff. I'm a, uh, I'm a nut for, uh, for history. So, and this is a, an important part of our electrical history. So this is a relay, and this would be mounted separate. Uh, these trip units, this is a trip unit, uh, one of our, a, a, a current trip unit uh, that's been around the block. I actually broke the plastic on it. But, uh, oh, let me, uh, let me put MobiCam on. OB1 Mobi, MobiCam. So this is a Digitrip 520MC. Uh, and you'll see that it has the trip curve on it. I've got the uh, long time delay, just like that was on that. I got a long time delay, long time pickup, a short time delay, a short short delay time, then short delay setting. A short delay setting is your pickup setting. So this would be a multiple of your of your I sub N, when in this case, 3,200 amps. Uh, there's your instantaneous. Now, when it says off, um, it, depending upon what breaker this is, it could really mean off or it just could be a very high setting, but it, it could be, uh, you gotta be careful when it says off. I know there are, there's at least one manufacturer and I'm not sure I'd have to look at the Digitrip 520MC if that really means off or if it goes to the, what we call the, um, instantaneous override. So in some cases, we will say off, but what we mean is that this trip unit is off, but the circuit breaker itself might have an instantaneous override. And remember, what is an instantaneous there for? When I, if I build that into my circuit breaker, I, that means it has to be there because I'm protecting my breaker. It has nothing to do with anything else. I'm protecting my circuit breaker, but I could provide an adjustable instantaneous for uh, your devices. So this is an external device. This could be uh, considered an external device. Uh, that Amptector or Relay could be considered external. Um, um, uh, I mean, we could have a debate and argument of is it external, is it integrated, uh, because it depends on the breaker. But in any case, um, I don't need this. Uh, that's what we're talking about, okay? So, because I can tell that device to open. Now, the, in Article 100, there's a bunch of other descriptions. LSIG. Are LSIG breakers, so, so, so Rob, you say, are LSIG breakers all use electronic trip units? Uh, the moment you start putting ground fault into a device, you're talking about an electronic type of, uh, of, of device. Even, even the little guys, um, the little breakers, uh, so Rob, so this is a residential breaker. Uh, this is an AFCI, but I believe it's it has ground fault built in as well. Uh, and your ground fault devices will have uh, what we call, if you'll look in here, it's hard to see it. Let me, I'm going to bring this up a little bit. You see that copper in there and there's a coil. Okay, so this is a, this is a, uh, uh, this is an AFGF breaker. But Right here is a coil, and right here is a coil. And these conductors pass through these coils. And one of them is ground fault detection. And, and you can see, look, look what's inside. You've got, a, you've got a digital board, okay? 
<clears throat> there is a uh, there is a board in there, and I wish I had a GFCI receptacle because I would take it apart right now, and it's probably in there, and I'm not going to walk away. So uh, maybe when we do a wiring device, I'll take a receptacle apart. But yes, so you have an electronics center. You have to have some sort of brain that determines when to trip. So you can have, any times you get into adjustable tripping, you really get, well, uh, I could have an adjustable instantaneous and not have electronics. And I'm going to show you a picture of the internal of a breaker. Uh, but you have adjustable circuit breakers. You have an instantaneous trip, inverse time. When we, when we say inverse time, that's our time current characteristic curve. The higher the current, the faster the trip, inverse time. Yeah, non-adjustable, and then you have uh, the setting. So in any case, these definitions are definitely changing. Look at that. It, it's I got a green screen, so my little screwdriver. But in any case, um, those are some definitions. We talked about the molded case breakers. We talked about the insulate. Insulated case up to 6,000 amps, as low as 800 amps. Um, power circuit breakers from 800 amps to 6,000 amps, same as an insulated case. But remember, a power breaker... I can actually turn the instantaneous off, truly turn the instantaneous off and have 30 cycles, 30 cycles. I can let up to the interrupting rating of that circuit breaker, I can let 30 cycles of fault current flow. That is a feat. Think about the magnetic forces that are going on inside of that circuit breaker. That is phenomenal. All right, and there's your 1077s. 1077s, I asked, I was in a class one time and there was a really cool guy teaching. And he said, a 1077, a supplementary device is a device you don't need in the circuit. It's supplementing. It's there for, um, it's not there for overcurrent protection. It's there for, uh, for turning something on and off and providing some protection. It's not a branch circuit. You can't protect a branch circuit with this. It, it, is a, it has a specific purpose in life. Um, so, uh, in any case, uh, these are, uh, are when, when you see a supplementary protector, they're usually in an industrial control panel, in a motor control center, something like that. They are not there for branch circuit protection. Supplemental circuit protected device with miniature circuit breakers. Absolutely, Tamaki. Yes. Uh, and, and I'm telling you, I've seen, th I've seen that in, in real, you know, we can talk about it and say it can happen, but I have seen it happen where that device was put into a circuit. It was uh, meant what a 1077 in a theater. 1077 in a theater. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, but um, they intended it for brand circuit protection, but it does not do that. It A 1077 device looks for, it has to have an upstream overcurrent protective device to give it short circuit protection, all that other good stuff. All right, I'm going to start going through water because, I don't know, I'm just really thirsty. Okay, so here is the, um, here's a, here is a, a, a sort of what's inside of a circuit breaker. Uh, you've got uh, contacts, you have an arc extinguisher, you have a trip bar, You've got your terminals. And you have your arc extinguishers. You have your contacts, your trip bar. You have an operating mechanism handle. Uh, you've got the frame, the whole bit. Uh, and so, James, uh, so I would say, James, from a, uh, you have to look, can a, can a 1077 device turn something on and off? Yes. If you're expecting it to be a branch circuit protection, then no. Okay, so you really have to look at, its use, what is your intended function for it? If you are going to try to protect conductors and things like that, uh, what is its rating uh, from a short circuit current perspective? What device do you need upstream of it to get a short circuit current rating that'll handle the fault current at where it's at? What is it being used in? So uh, use in UL508A control panels. Exactly, exactly. You are exactly right. Put those in a 508A panel and you're good to go. And if that's in a if if that's in a theater, James, then you're good to go. 
It's a listed 508A application. You can have a 1077 device inside there. Even a 107, there's fuses that are supplementary fuses as well. All right. Okay, so now inside, um, before we go there, so we, we went over the case. Um, let me do this. So if you think about this circuit breaker, there's your handle, right? Here are, here are your terminals uh, and your lugs. Let's turn this thing on the other side. So there's your lugs where your conductors would go on. There is a, you'll see where it says line. And then you'll see down on the bottom where it says load, okay? So it's marked line and load. And that means you can't backfeed this circuit breaker because it's marked line and load. Line is always up here. Load is always down there. If you are trying to use this in a photovoltaic application and you're backfeeding through this, that would be a misapplication of this device. And I'm going to point out to you an error in Article 705 that you may or may not know about. If you have your... 20, if you have your code book open, go to 705, 705 dot, oh man, I knew it. I was just on a program with Tim McClintock, and I told him about this, and you would have thought that when he found the, the language that I did not mark it. It's premises, microgrid, ground fault protection, load side sources. I know it's in 705. There's the taps. Power control suitable for backfeed. I found it. And look what I'm going to do. Where's my pen? Uh-oh. I need my, my Keith Laughlin pen. I, I don't have my Keith Laughlin pen. I, I'm, I'm not. Here it is. My Keith Laughlin pen. Did I ever tell you about this one? These little blue stripes in there are actually electrical tape. He made this himself. So take a look in 705.12, 705.12D, as in David, suitable for backfeed. And this was changed in the 2020 code, and it is, it is so wrong. Uh, it says... Um, Fused disconnects, unless otherwise marked, shall be considered suitable for backfeed. Circuit breakers not marked, line and load, shall be considered suitable for backfeed. And that is true. If this was not marked, line and load, then it would be suitable for backfeed. And I'll give you an example of that right here. So uh, this is an HMCPS. Okay, that's a motor circuit protector. So that's not even that's this is a uh, 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 this is a uh, uh, hold on. This is a motor circuit protector, so it's uh, it's really supplemental, and it's suitable for use on single phase AC three poles, instantaneous. It's UL recognized, you not UL listed. So this is a UR UL recognized product. That's what I was looking for, and it was right there. So it's a recognized product, not a UL listed product. That means it's going to be only be able to be used in a piece of equipment. And this would be a motor circuit, uh, and 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 it'll tell you exactly where you can apply this. But it's marked line and load. So there's the line, and there's the load. Here's another. This is a, a true 489 device, and look, there is no line and load on this at all. So I can backfeed this breaker, but I cannot backfeed this breaker. So Indeed goes on to say, and this is when things go wry, and I don't know, I think it's a, I, it says circuit breakers marked line and load shall be considered suitable for backfeed or reverse current if specifically rated. You will never, if it's marked line and load, you cannot backfeed. It would void, it would violate the UL listing if you did, if you marked it line and load, they'd have to change the standard 
to be able to meet this. So that last sentence in 705.12d is wrong. Um, you could take your code book and do like I'm doing, and you can strike that and hind highlight it. That is an, an error, and we're going to hopefully fix that this cycle. But in any case, um, uh, so this is a different type of breaker. This is a motor circuit protector, and I'll tell you the difference. This device. Okay, a motor circuit. Remember a, a thermomagnetic circuit breaker. This is the trip curve. Okay, that's a thermomagnetic circuit breaker. An HMCP, a motor circuit protector, the curve looks like that. There's no overload on it. It's only short circuit protection. So you can't use this device a motor circuit protector in a branch circuit because there's no thermal, there's no thermal capabilities to protect overload. And we're gonna get into the internals now and I'm gonna help you understand how that portion of the curve is created. Never been, I've never, I've, I've never even thought programmable time can be achieved without a microcontroller. Mm -hmm. There is a micro in, in um, uh, there's a microcontroller in there. And I'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll show you uh, some, some of that as we go forward. All right. So let's talk about the contact assemblies. We have uh, inside of these circuit breakers, there's a set of contacts. And what we do is we reverse loop those so that the magnetic forces want to push those contacts apart. Your small breakers will do the standard linear design. Um, I'm just looking at a molded case, uh, like a miniature circuit breaker here. I'm trying to find one that... Uh, yeah. Well, see, this is even looped back on itself as well. So, this is your molded case circuit breaker, and your your contact mechanism is is right in here. So, as I close this, you see it moving. Oops. Your contact is right here. And it's going to come down onto this. And this is what ties onto the bus. And over here is where you would land your load conductors going to the load. This goes on the bus inside the panel board. So this contact, when I close this breaker, will come in contact from here, right here, over to here. And now it's closed. And, and your thermal trip and everything is up in here, and I'll show you how this all works, and your magnetic is up here, and there's a latch mechanism, but the contact that we're talking about is right here. Now, that contact is a combination of materials. There are uh, a lot of different types of materials that are on that contact, and I thought a while ago when I was putting a slide deck together that I was going to say, hey, what's it made out of, and come up with a... Uh, uh, you know, here's what it is. It's this material. And I found out that when I went to the design engineer on the breaker, I said, hey, what do we make contacts out of? And he said, uh, which breaker? I said, oh, well, the, the BAB breaker. And he goes, uh, what amp rating? <laughs> and so um, it's a science, I'll just say, uh, based on what I've learned. Uh, so, But tungsten uh, and silver is very common in these, and, and when you look at the tungsten, the tungsten is a very porous, it's like a sponge and very hard. So the tungsten gives the durability of the contact. The silver we know is a soft material, but very highly conductive. So there's tungsten and silver and probably some other mixtures of, uh, of components in there that actually conduct that. And you want something that's durable and you want something that is going to be conductive, low resistance. 
So there's varying components. You want durability, you have to think about temperature, and you think about resistivity. Now, the extinguisher. That is, um, here is a picture of, uh, of the extinguisher. Here's an actual extinguisher out of a circuit breaker. All right, so this is an extinguisher. You'll see how it has plates, okay? And you'll notice that it has this U-shape here. The contact itself will travel in that U-shape. And when it draws the arc, the extinguisher does its job, just like Napoleon, it to divide and conquer. And it uh, basically, the arc is separated and cooled on these plates. And, and so this is, uh, the, there's three sets of contacts in a three-phase breaker. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, these are out of one single circuit breaker. And then the bigger the breaker, okay, so this is a, that's one, right? And this is out of a larger circuit breaker. Okay, so these are the extinguishers. This is the extinguisher out of a larger amp frame breaker. And the job of this extinguisher, again, whether regardless of the size, is to separate that arc. The arc will travel in through those uh, fingers and it will cool itself and it will extinguish, hence the name, arc extinguisher. Okay, so the job of the arc extinguisher is to extinguish the arc. And I do have a video of that. And this is what happens whenever the contacts open the arc will be extinguished as it flows up through the, um, those plates. All right. I got coffee. I got water. Jeez, oh man. So that's the arc extinguisher doing its job. So going through these, I'll give you a perspective of size. These are the two devices. Um, so these are out of two separate, uh, different uh, things. So and that's that's basically. Yep, I would say it's just like that. Well, like this. Okay, so that's your arc extinguisher right here. All right, so that's basic. Oh yeah, the way it is. So there you go. So that's the arc extinguisher. That's what's. Uh, that's what helps stop that flow of current. Now, thermal protection. We've said it a few times, and thermal protection is that top portion of the, uh, the overload region of a trip curve. That is done by a bimetal. What do we mean by a bimetal? Uh, bi is two, two metals. Uh, two metals that when you heat them, they change form at a different rate. Okay, so I have two metals like this and say this metal, when I heat it, bends faster or slower than this metal. So when I, when I, um, if I, if I do my math correctly and my physics correctly and, 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 and I, uh, my, all my mechanical engineers are doing, you know, working overnight, they, when it, when the, um, when the bimetal heats up, it will bend. And then what eventually will happen is it'll let a, a trip lever fall and open the circuit breaker. So sustained overloads because I have to heat the, it's a physical heating of the bimetal. Okay. And it, this, this is your contact metal. This is your contact mechanism here. And then as you come down through, there's that coil that, cause the, the arm that the contacts are moving. So we have to do like a braided copper wire and you'll see that uh, in uh, mold, in smaller mold decay circuit breakers, you'll see that braided copper wire is right here. Okay, that braided copper wire is connecting the arm of of the contact to my bimetal mechanism. That's basically um, I've got to let current pass through it. So that uh, that little uh, braid of wire is important so that my contact still opens because remember I've got to supply power to the load and then that bimetal is going to heat and this is basically what's happening is it's bending and then there's a latch and uh, my trip bar uh, now this is a simplification if you looked at every single circuit breaker it's not going to you know we don't have a magnetic coil in in our in our breakers I do have 
uh, one of our European designs, but it is this is a UL listed UL 489 device too, but this is more of a C. This this is still UL, but this is um, I see more of these designs in our uh, from an international perspective. But you'll notice there's no in this breaker, and I have a video of this. In this breaker, there's there's I've got a spring holding things together, but I don't have that plunger that you see here. Okay, see that coil, that magnetic element? That's not thermal, that's the magnetic. That's your short circuit protection. Your thermal is handled by the by the bimetal, but the magnetic, that's for the very high fault currents, is handled sometimes by that magnetic element, which is could be a coil and a plunger, uh, but I call it the clapper <laughs> in, in, a, in, in a molded case circuit breaker. Um, because it's because it, it's basically it's it, that's what it is. I mean, <clears throat> you look right here. This this is my latch, and let me just look here. It is on, so this breaker is on. Now I have no wires to connected to this breaker, so it's on, but it is not energized. It is in the on position. So this is my lever, which is my magnetic, and what happens? When I have a very high fault current flowing through this, the magnetic forces will draw this clapper, this lever in, and it will trip because this metal piece right here is the latch. And it's in a slot inside this metal piece. I don't know if I can turn it up. If you can see that. Let me get some light. There we go. So this... This right here, there's a slot inside this latch, inside this uh, uh, mechanism, and this metal bar is inside that. So when I push this like that, it trips. So I don't know if I can show that. Yeah, you can almost see it. You see that there's a there's a a slot right in here that my um, that my uh, my my trip bar or my my latch rests in. So I'm going to reset this breaker. See how it latched? And then I close it again. I close the contact. See the contacts going open and closed. You see my little uh, wire moving there? Okay. I'm going to close it. And then when I press this, that's the magnetic portion. That's the instantaneous. I, you see, I, I, it, I'm going to push it and then it trips. Now I got to reset it. I got to turn it to the off position. It's going to go up. It's going to slide right in that slot. Now it's latched, and I can close and open the contacts. Now, for the bimetal, what I have to do is I'm going to bend this. Let's get rid of this light. I like the theatrics. Talk about a theater, James. So... I'm going to show you the bimetal, and I'm going to bend this. I'm going to put this in as a lever, and you see how I'm bending it? And now it trips. So I'm going to do that again. So when I, when I come in here and I, I go like this, I'm bending. Now there's, some, there's, there's tension there because there's friction that there's a slot, and that, that bar is sitting in that slot like this, and as I move it away, there's, there's friction. Now, when I, when I pull this and I bend it like if it was heating, and then it trips. So there's my bimetal. I can bend it. I can bend this bimetal back and forth. Hard to do this. I can bend it back and forth, and then this is my latch. When my, when my, magne my, when my magnetic forces draw that in, it drops the latch, and, uh, and it trips that breaker. So what I was just showing you is what this diagram is trying to convey. And this is a small miniature thermomagnetic circuit breaker with a cutaway on the side. And this breaker is, if the, the principles are the same, even when you get to the larger breakers. And I have, the, I have a picture of a larger uh, thermomagnetic breaker. Now, we say a magnetic, and I show you the magnetic as a coil and plunger. You just saw that there's no coil or plunger in this breaker. It's 
magnetic forces pulling a plate in. But I do have circuit breakers that have a coil. Okay, I take Moby Cam 1 and look at this breaker. Okay, bring it up closer. You see right here? That is a coil and there's a plunger inside. And that is my magnetic capability for this circuit breaker. When you look, 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 see that? Look at how small that contact is right here. That's my contact. And there's not much to it. And when that opens, my gases and whatnot will vent out through there. Now this breaker is, it's a U049 breaker, 20 amps. So this is a 20 amp circuit breaker that has, uh, and, and this is a 15 amp circuit breaker. So two 15, 20 amp circuit breakers, basically, you know, the same type of thing, but two totally different designs. There are multiple ways that, that you can implement circuit protection. And this shows you, this one will have that plunger and, and, and coil. Uh, where's the bimetal in this one? The bimetal is actually over here. Okay. And, and, and this is my, uh, this is a, a bolt on, on both sides. So I, I put a conductor on this side and a conductor on that side. And it's not labeled line and load. Copper only conductor. So there's the, um, you know, I'm going to do, hold on. I am going to, I'm going to try to make this happen. So let me do a, I got to um, go to camera control and focus. I want to get it nice and close. And then I'm going to try to focus this. So bear with me. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Okay, so this is, there's the, the information on it. And look what it says. It says IEC 60947-2. Okay, so that's your 60947-2. I've got to get this out of my way so I can see what you see so that I make sure. Okay, so yeah, my head wasn't in the way. Okay, so this is, you see the standard says ENIEC 60947-2. That's the IEC standard. It also has a UL listed to 489. So this is a special device. Okay, and um, the, it has the torque values on it. It has an interrupting rating, 10,000 amps. Current limiting circuit breaker. Um, ICU is 15,000 amps. ICS is five uh, equals 7. 0.5 k kiloamps. That's your interrupting capabilities uh, on the IEC set. 240 volt, 415 volt, 50, 60 hertz. It hurts. It really does. 10,000 amp interrupting rating, current limiting. And then if I look at the front, whoop. Okay, there's your uh, UL489 right on the front, 20 amp breaker. 277 volt AC and you have your catalog number all your information on that so so some breakers will have uh, uh, they'll have different ways to uh, provide short circuit and overload protection now the overload protection if I think about that bimetal we already talked about this as I heat that bimetal up it will bend and then it will eventually trip the circuit breaker. I'm not sure if this is animated or not. Yes, yep, there it is. So there's your trip. And we already did this, so you already saw what that does. And you already saw the magnetic forces as they go. They will trip that circuit breaker. All right, so this is uh, a video I did many years ago. Absolutely amazing. Watch this. <laughs> I did this um, a long time ago, magnetic armature. So I did this on my desk on a piece of paper. And, and it is the breaker that I use today. So um, I've actually managed to keep it. 
So this shows you, this is telling you how uh, the magnetic armature, so what, what I showed you, remember, it's the clapper, and I did it in slow motion. So that's the benefit of this, is I'm going to push that lever in, and when I push it in, it will drop that lever, boom. Okay, and we just saw that, uh, and this is actually probably a much nicer video than what I was doing over here on my little Moby Cam 1. Now the magnetic, that was the magnetic. Now I'm going to do the thermal. And remember, the thermal is a bimetal, and that's going to bend. Now watch, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to do the same thing. And I, 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 I had a Series C uh, screwdriver when I was using this. I'm going to bend that. You see how it bends? And then that latch is going to drop. And then I do a reset in uh, full speed, and you'll actually see me reset the breaker because you'll. What's interesting is to see how it latches again. All right, so this is the latch goes in, and then the contact goes closed, and then I press that, and that that does the. And then I I reset it and I latch it. And then I will do the thermal. Boom. All right. So, so, and, and I don't know, uh, that was a long time ago that I did that. Thomas Nash, I was national application engineer and I don't, ah, I didn't do the date. Okay. So now this is a picture of a larger, um, mo the trip unit for a, it's a thermal magnetic trip unit. You'll notice there's dials on it. And those dials, these dials, I can adjust my instantaneous. And each dial is necessary for each phase. It's not like one dial is short time, another dial is instantaneous, another dial is long time pickup. This is a device that's an 800 amp device, period. Those three dials adjust the instantaneous for each phase. So if I'm going to change the instantaneous for this breaker, I want to make sure I put each of these on the exact same setting. Now inside, uh, this is the circuit breaker that it goes into. So you'll see, here's my, look at that. See that? You see that, that, that top of the red? Look. Okay, I'm going to put this the way it is in there. Okay, so that's what you're looking at over there. Uh, is the top of this, and there's that little nub. Okay, this is just a different size than what you have here. But that's your arc extinguisher inside that breaker. And that arm that you see is the is the contact that's going to go right down in the center of that. The handle's right there in the middle. And, this, and there's your trip unit right here that sits right down at the bottom of the circuit breaker. Now, if you take that circuit breaker out, look, it's the same principle. This is a plate that you see and where my finger is there. Those are three plates for the instantaneous that it's the clapper concept. Okay, clap on, clap off. When, when that, mag, the, the, um, the silver bar is where your lugs are when your current is flowing through that, right? And when the magnetic forces get high enough, it will pull that, that flat plate in up against it and it will trip the circuit breaker, okay? It's the same concept as this tiny, small, mold decay circuit breaker, same concept. It's just another good close-up of it, and you can see how it's, uh, um, how you have the loop. I don't know if you can see my mouse there or not, but uh, that's the loop. There's your, uh, there's your just different views of the instantaneous portion of that circuit breaker. So, uh, that the, the TCC curve, again, we already talked about the time current characteristic curve and okay, the upper portion is your bimetal. The, the instantaneous is your magnetic elements, whether it be the um, whether it be a clapper or a, or the coil on a plunger. All right, now the time current characteristic curve, just to give you, um, if you're not familiar, the time current characteristic curve is um, um, what we call log to log. 
okay, each of these little gray lines are the, the very bottom right down here. The space is bigger than the next one, which is bigger, which is the space is bigger than the next one. The next one is smaller. The next one's smaller. So basically, if if you if you e made each of these lines an equal space, right? So 0.1 to one, if you made those lines equal space, this paper would stretch pretty doggone far. Uh, and, and what they did, they do a log to log so that we can get a nice little curve that um, instead of looking at some huge, huge, uh, uh, really uh, odd looking curves, we can put it on a log to log paper and now you see a nice uh, trip curve. So the only reason we use log to log is because of the number of data points and we want to get everything into a nice compact form. Else this paper would be huge, it would be huge. So there's a trip curve for a thermomagnetic circuit breaker, non-adjustable, it's a 100 amp circuit breaker and, and you'll notice that for increased fault currents, you have faster clearing times. Uh, there is an adjustable instantaneous. So that those three dials that I showed you is doing something like this. It's moving the instantaneous to a lower value. Why would I do that? I might want to reduce incident energy. I might want to uh, selectively coordinate with a breaker that's upstream, and I want to coordinate in the overload region and not bump into that instant the instantaneous of the upstream device or possibly uh, up here uh, in the top portion of this little knee right here, I might not want to uh, uh, bump into the overload region of the upstream device. So I might want to adjust that instantaneous, provide a better level of protection for the whatever it is that's downstream. Non-adjustable thermomagnetic breaker. It's a, This is a 600 amp thermomag breaker. That's all it is. That's all it will be. That's all it will ever be. Now, Article 100 talks about the interrupting rating. So now, so so what we've done so far is we've talked about the mechanical nature. We've talked about the arc extinguishers, what they are. We've we've talked about the bimetals. We've talked about the plungers, right? This is all mechanical engineering. This, you know, I was surprised when I first came to work for Eaton. I was nervous because there's a lot of smart people at Eaton, and I was a young engineer. And I thought, boy, there are a lot of smart electrical engineers at Eaton. And so I went to, uh, I, I started working in the Advanced Product Support Center, taking, taking numbers and, uh, you know, answering phones and uh, solving problems. And I went over to the design engineers and I, uh, I said, uh, I, I asked them, I said, you know, I don't know why, but I always ask people, are you an electrical engineer? What, what, you know, what's your degree? And uh, they, they would say, well, I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm like, oh. And I had asked someone else, so you know, what do you, what's your degree? I'm a mechanical engineer. And I asked someone else, what are you? I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm like, gosh darn it, there's a lot of mechanical engineers. I was thinking, I'm expecting to see a lot of electrical engineers, but they said, Tom, did you ever look inside of a breaker? It's a very mechanical device. It's and 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 I get it now. These are it's a very mechanical device. There's a lot of magnetic forces. There's springs. There's uh, coils. So a very mechanical device. So now we're going to get into the ratings. Interrupting rating is an important aspect of a circuit breaker. And, and an interrupting rating, um, interrupting rating in the National Electrical Code tells us that I'm just going to look in Article 100. My book is falling apart. This is the 2020 code book, and it's already pages are falling out of it. Jeez, oh man, interrupting rating. E-F-G-H-I, it comes after H. Interrupting rating, the highest current at rated voltage that a device is identified to interrupt under standard test conditions. Now, here's, the another, here's another little revelation that I had. An interrupting rating doesn't have to be the rating for short circuit interruption. A device like a contactor could have an interrupting rating that's not an, a short circuit current. It could be a load current that it's interrupting. Remember, it's the highest current at rated voltage that a device is identified to interrupt, which is stop the flow of current, 
under standard test conditions. So um, equipment intended to interrupt current at other than fault levels, and the informational note really helps, and equipment intended to interrupt current at other than fault levels may have its interrupting rating implied in other ratings, such as horsepower or locked rotor current. Okay, so the highest current and at rated voltage. So it's important uh, that we throw the voltage in there because what is voltage? Voltage is pressure pushing current through the circuit and higher voltages will be a little bit more demanding on a, on a circuit breaker like this than lower voltages. Less pressure at the lower voltages, easier to interrupt. So my interrupting ratings will be higher at a lower voltage than they will be at higher voltages. Uh, so what happens when you exceed the interrupting rating? So I'm going to show you a circuit breaker and a fuse that are both, uh, the, the, the fuse is rated to interrupt 10,000 amps. The circuit breaker in this example is only rated to interrupt 14,000 amps. I'm going, I'm going to hit these puppies with 50,000 amps. And what happens? Let's take a look. They achieve an unintended rapid disassembly in the field. The fuse and the circuit breaker, when misapplied, will fail or could fail. If you misapply a product, you can have an unintended rapid disassembly in the field. It's a misapplication of those devices. Anything you misapply can become a problem, and this is an example of that. Now, uh, 240 is, what's the title of Article 240? Overcurrent protection. So you would think that there are a lot of requirements in 240 about circuit breakers. Now, do they use ceramic magnets for any, for any of that operation inside the motor case circuit breaker? I don't believe so. I've not seen any ceramic magnets inside of a multi case circuit breaker. And here is a really old one. This is a really, I, I would say, Robert, I'm not familiar with that at all. I don't believe that there are any, um, uh, any, any uh, ceramic. Look at this circuit breaker. This is a very old um, use in listed enclosure okay i have a catalog uh i have a i have a brochure which i wish i had it and then it's a marketing brochure and it says say goodbye to fuses and it shows this breaker but look at this device look at the contacts right above my head up there okay there's the contact right there i'm going to turn this on and off look at that That's the, that's, that is, uh, it's a very, and, and it's, it's an, it is a very old breaker. And, and it was a cutaway, a uh, marketing cutaway. And I think it, I think the picture of this breaker, I'd love to do a comparison, is the one that was in the uh, catalog, uh, that marketing literature. Uh, and it has a different way to log on, get onto the bus too. I don't know if you can see that. So, uh, the the way it mounts, so the way a circuit breaker mounts onto the bus, will the, the these these clips and how it mounts. Like this one has clips. This has a a, a little foot down here, and it's a, a, a it slides onto a bus. Um, you know, this circuit breaker has lugs on one side and has lugs on the other side. So you would mount this. Um, you would probably put this in a. Uh, um, in a motor control center, because this is an HMCP, this is a standard breaker. This could mount on the bus inside of a um, of a, of a panel board, right? So uh, they're just designed differently, and, and the, the the mounting mechanism used to uh, install it inside of a piece of equipment will vary. And you you could probably you could buy these with different lugs and different kits to go into different equipment. So. 240.83, before I uh, I cried squirrel over here, uh, 240 is overcurrent protection. Two, part 7 
is titled Circuit Breakers. So in 240. Dot, the very beginning of 240, 240 to part one is called general. Those are the general requirements. And then in part two is location. Part, uh, part two is location, I believe it's part two. My book is uh, ripped. Yeah, part two is location. Gosh, I'm Neds. Article 240 uh, pages. I, I get a lot of use out of 240. Part three is enclosures. Part four is disconnecting and guarding. And part five is plug fuses and fuses and fuse holders and adapters. Plugs, uh, part six, cartridge fuse and fuse holders. Part seven is circuit breakers. And that starts at 240.80. 240.83 says marking, durable and visible. Okay, so durable and visible. Um, Moby cam. Okay, durable and visible. So these labels all have to be durable and visible. Circuit breakers shall be marked with their ampere rating in a manner that will be durable and visible after installation. We have it right on the handle here. It's on here as well on the on the dead front or on the faceplate. Shall, uh, such marking shall be permitted to be made visible by removal of a trim or cover. So what's nice about having it on the handle is when I put a cover over it, you'll see there's a lip right here. You see that little lip? That uh, the dead front may be covering this. And uh, Sh Sharish, uh, Nanda, this will be on my YouTube channel, so you can watch it whenever you want to. It'll be up there and loaded up on uh, on YouTube. The location, circuit breakers rated at 100 amps or less and 1,000 volts or less shall have an ampere rating molded, stamped, etched, or similarly marked into their handles. So circuit breakers rated at 100 amps or less. This is 15. So it has to be in the handle. So it's meeting the code requirement. I'll bet you it's a part of UL 489 as well. Interrupting rating. Every circuit breaker having an interrupting rating other than 5,000 amps shall have its interrupting rating shown on the circuit breaker. The interrupting rating shall not be required to be marked on the circuit breakers used for supplementary protection. Supplementary. Now, if it's not marked, you're assuming, if you find a breaker and it does not have an interrupting rating on it, you check the faceplate, you've looked at the side labels, you've looked at the back, anything that it's in the back labels, you've looked on the side, um, you've looked at the, if, if, if there is no interrupting rating on this breaker, you assume it's 5,000 amps based upon the code. Um, circuit breakers used as switches in 120 volt and 277 volt fluorescent lighting circuits, fluorescent lighting circuits shall be listed and shall be marked SWD or HID. Fluorescence. Did you know that? If you are switching fluorescence, remember, this is switches. Use the switches. When would you use that? You would use, oh, torque is labeled. Yes, torque is labeled. Hold on. Let me, uh, let me, give, you, uh, let me give you some uh, uh, clarity. Watch how we add clarity, uh, Sharish. Watch this. I go to camera control and I go to focus. Look at that. There it is. All right. So torque is on here. Now, do I have one? HID. HID. I don't know if I have a circuit breaker that is marked. HID. I probably don't. Oh, let me try this one. My eyes are getting bad. Um, oh, yeah, baby. Yeah, baby. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm loving this. Look at that. H I D S W D. And what does, um, Circuit breaker, circuit breaker, circuit breakers used as switches. Now I'm in 240.83D. Circuit breakers used as switches in 120 volt and 277 volt fluorescent lighting circuits shall be listed and shall be marked SWD 
or HID. Circuit breakers used as switches in high intensity discharge lighting circuits shall be listed and shall be marked as HID. Did you know if you are switching? Now, when would I do that? Um, if you think about it, go, if we, we, you go into a uh, go into a, a, a warehouse, and and how do they turn lights on in a warehouse? You don't flip a little switch. They go over to a breaker like this and they switch. Oh, they switch it. You want know to see something really cool? Watch this. Look at that. July two thousand fourteen. It has my name on it. Power Components Division and Product Roadmap and Prioritization Event. It's got my name on it, etched in it. I love it. All right, so HIDSWD. Now, um, I know that I have, I've got some stuff on that. Here we go. All right, so now let's talk HID. And, and you know what? It, I did a program for Donnie Cook down in Shelby County, Alabama. I mean, I know breakers, but I, H, it says if you're switching fluorescence, so you got all those fluorescents up there, you have to make sure it's marked HID. Now, what is an HID? A HID, 50 amps or less, circuit breakers rated 480 volts or less, may be marked. This is out of UL 489. They are suitable for switching high intensity discharge or fluorescent lighting loads on a regular basis. They can employ a different construction than a standard SWD breaker in order to address the high inrush current resulting from the lower power factor created by the HID lighting. Okay, power factor. Okay, you I hope that you're watching if you're if you're if you're if you're following this channel. I did I did uh, uh, calculating fault currents. We talked about complex variables. We talked about symmetrical components, right? I talked about power factor, and it's all about that triangle, right? It's the reactance and the resistance. And remember, a power distribution system has has uh, has inductive loads. It has capacitive loads. I could have power factor correction capacitors in there. I could have capacitive coupling. I got all this good stuff going on. How, when I com comprise my power system, remember, I have, I I'm, I'm, I'm following your um, uh, trigonometry. Uh, I'm, I don't know much about history, uh, but I know a little bit about trigonometry. These, uh, you have the, the X to R ratio, right? We, we talked about X to R ratio. The inverse tangent of uh, x over r gives you me my my theta, and my theta is my power factor. So that is it tells me my angle for my system, which helps me understand the the um, the the angle difference between voltage and current in your power system, right? So let's just take a look at. For example, power factor at 80%, my theta is 36.87 degrees. My X to R ratio is 0.75. And as I change power factor, so this is this is my, my voltage and my current sine wave for a power factor of 90%. 90%. That's an angle of 25.84. So angle of 25.84 degrees an X to R of 0.484. You'll see the closeness of my voltage and my current. They are very close to each other. 100%, I'm going to be right on top of each other. You're not going to have 100%. But as my power factor gets worse, look at what happens between voltage and current. My waveforms are separating from each other. 60% power factor, 50% power factor. Now, when my voltage is zero, my current is still high. I'm at 25%. Look at my, uh, at 180 degrees where my voltage is crossing the zero line, my current is at its peak, okay? So the worse uh, my power factor is, the more out of sync between voltage and current, the harder it is for me to stop the flow of current because my voltage is crossing zero, okay? It's easier 
when I have a higher power factor for my for my device to stop that flow of current. When current is zero on this curve, when current is crossing zero, my voltage is down at minus 0.5. Okay, so I've got some voltage. I'm crossing zero. I want to cross. I I want to stop the flow of current when uh, when I'm crossing that when current's crossing zero. But look at that angle. Okay, so what the HID device is doing is it's realizing that you have a load because it's a fluorescent load and 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 because it's um, high intensity discharge, all these great things, we know that the load and the power factor, it's harder to interrupt and you're gonna be doing it what? You're gonna be turning the lights on in the morning, turn the lights off at night, turn the lights on in the morning, turn the lights off at night, turn the lights on in the morning, and maybe you go out to lunch and you turn those lights back off because you want to save money, you come back from lunch, and then you go home. You're going to be turning that thing on and off and on and off. So it has to be rated, it has to be listed and tested to be able to do that under those uh, types of, um, of, of uh, difference in power factor. Now, um, high-intensity discharge. Uh, circuit breakers rated 50 amps maximum, so you're not going to have an HID at 60 or 100 amps. An HID lighting loads on a regular basis. You're switching these things on and off on a regular basis. They have to be subjected to endurance tests uh, to be able to handle that. Okay, now let's take a look at some of the tests. This is out of the standard. Uh, additional circuit breakers are to be subjected to the temperature test. So these are for H HID breakers, high-intensity discharge breakers. In addition to the standard tests, you're going to subject these after 999, 1,000, 3,001 operations of endurance. So you're going to subject these to a temperature test. The endurance test shall be in accordance with endurance tests in 715, except that the load shall have a power factor in the range of 45 to 50 percent. After the 999th and two two thousand almost three thousand operations. Each circuit breaker is to be operated only to close the context for the temperature test. Uh, so this is, I mean, the important part here is it's it's at a lower power factor, and you're operating these things up to three thousand times. And then you have um, a circuit breaker intended to switch HID lighting loads on a regular basis. Again, on a regular basis, and comply with performance and. Per the National Electrical Code, if you're switching HID, you've got to have, you got to look for that HID on there. Uh, in this case, this is HID and SWD, okay? Um, and, and I don't have to do that for a breaker, okay? I, 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 now, I, I can't tell you, I can't, you know, I, I, I can't tell you if every one of these breakers are listed that way. Or if we have breakers that aren't HID, I'd have to look at my catalog and tell you. Um, if I had my buddy Lou Grayhor on here, he could probably tell you. Uh, suitable for switching. So SWD, circuit breakers rated 347 volts or less, may be marked 15 or 20 amps. SWD, which means they are suitable for switching fluorescent lighting loads on a regular basis. Oh, look at this. Okay, so MobiCam 1. Look. This is my uh, 20 amp uh, 480 volt. Here's what you would have in your house. Look what it says, SWD. So my standard molded case circuit breaker and hacker, which HAC, that's your HVAC. You don't have to label those anymore. I think they even took that out of the standard, uh, but we still keep those on the breakers. I don't know why. Um, SWD versus HID. So uh, SWD is for switching fluorescence. HID is high intensity discharge lighting. That's a different light. So SWD is a 15 or 20 amp breaker. HID, it can be on up to a 50 amp breaker because your HID, high intensity discharge lighting, is going to be a different type of light. Um, high... HID lighting, HID lighting. Okay, I'm just going to uh, throw this up. HID lighting bulbs. Uh, we're just going to do a quick 
So there's your HID lights, okay? Right, those are, those are you'll see those like in your, uh, uh, et cetera. So a 1077 device, uh, James, I don't believe you're gonna have a 1077 device that's HID listed. Uh, I don't know about that. I, 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 gotta, I gotta look that up. I gotta look that up. I, 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 I say that and I, I don't know that for sure. Uh, HID, my gut tells me no because, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm switching off fluorescent lights. It's high intensity. It, 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 my gut tells me no, but I gotta look that up, James, and I'll, I'll write that down, and maybe next time uh, I will bring that, uh, or I'll put it up on my website as a common question. You can use the, use the, um, go to thomasdimitrovich.com and go to the uh, resources and go to the chat. HID uh, on uh, 1077. You love those 1077s, James, don't you? Right, Sharish, 1077 is not a 489 device. And James, you got to give me, enlighten me a little bit on why you love those 1077 devices. Uh, that's okay. All right, I'm not, I'm not yelling at you. <laughs> I know you got thick skin, brother. Okay, so uh, 1520 amp breakers, switch duty, that is a fluorescent. Switching duty circuit breaker, a circuit breaker intended to switch fluorescent lighting loads on a regular basis. Oh, the, yeah, 1077 is not going to do that because it's not brand circuit rated. So you're not going to have those in a panel board supplying a brand circuit to go to those. That's not going to be a 1077 device. It's going to be a UL489 device. Ah, see that? We arrive at these answers Whew, really cool. Switch duty, rated circuit breakers shall comply with the construction requirements on all 6.1. Circuit breakers intended to switch fluorescent lighting on a regular basis, subject to the endurance and temperature. So remember, it's, it's, it's about endurance and temperature. It's not about the inrush current and the higher instantaneous. It is about a poor power factor type of load. The waveforms are separated. I'm going to be opening and closing and stopping the flow of current as a switch on that. And I, and the breaker has to be tested for that. So uh, components more robust in an SWD breaker, Joe Bellantoni. Um, my gut tells me, this is what my gut tells me. My gut tells me that what's inside this breaker that is labeled SWD HID is probably if I, if I even make one that's not listed as HID SWD, which I'm not sure the answer to that question yet, I'd have to take a look at my catalog. And if we have time, I'll do that. But we probably have the same components on the inside because it would probably not be from a manufacturing perspective. You know, I don't know how many HID SWDs we sell over a standard, but my gut tells me the guts are probably the same. My gut tells me the guts are probably the same, but I'll, I'll list it differently and test some of these differently um, because of uh, uh, from a marketing perspective and from a UL perspective. I probably pay UL more to add HID and SWD on on breakers, so I'm not going to list all of them that way. So will they? I I don't know for a fact if everything inside is exactly the same, but my I don't know based on manufacturing rules and regulations and or you know the way we do business and. If I make a pen and I say this pen's going to uh, going to last a hundred years, uh, and then I know that uh, it'll cost me more to try to make make components, I'll probably make the pen the same way and say, well, one pen is not a hundred years because I just change a little clip over here, uh, and uh, all I do is change that clip out, and now it'll last a hundred years. So, you know, I I, I don't know. It, it it there's probably differences in there. I can't answer that question. All right, so this is SWD. If I look at the SWD requirements in the standard, uh, we're saying uh, uh, shall be subject to a temperature test after 999 up to 3,000 operations of endurance. So this is primarily looking at endurance, okay? That's an endurance type of discussion, right? So here's... Uh, Circuit breakers intended to switch fluorescent lighting on a regular basis shall comply with switch duty rated circuit breakers shall comply with, they have to be marked SWD, which we saw that. Uh, there's your, the 2005 NEC no longer has a marking requirement uh, for hackers, so you're not uh, required to do that. 
uh, the requirement for this marking has been, so the requirement for the marking was removed, but that doesn't mean I don't have to put, I, I can't put a hacker marking on it. As we saw on this circuit breaker here, uh, it does say hacker, H-A-C-R, right? Hacker, at least that's just the, what we say. Uh, 24083 includes requirements. So, so let's go back to 24083. I'm telling you, there's a lot of cool stuff in here. 24083 voltage marking. I have to have voltage. Uh, oh, so so uh, this was out of a program I did down in Alabama, and because we were having some issues with LED lighting, when you put a lot of LEDs on a on a circuit breaker, uh, there is a lot of inrush current on uh, the drivers for circuit breakers, and in fact. Uh, uh, Bob Handick, Bobby Handick, uh, who works in our residential, did some testing, I believe, on a 20-amp circuit. He measured over 200 amps of inrush current. Um, so the LED lighting, and, and, and the reason this question was in there was because uh, Donnie Cook was uh, having some questions, having some breakers trip uh, when they energized and turned on LED lighting. And he was like, why is that? And and it's because of that inrush current. So you need a high magnetic pick up on some of these breakers uh, and and we do sell breakers with a higher magnetic pickup voltage has to be marked to d talks about okay this is uh that's your hid we already talked about that okay um all right okay so hid and then you have to have your voltage so from a rating perspective i will have voltage ratings uh, interrupting rating. So I got on this HID, so I went out of order. Let me get back to my PowerPoint. I'm going to close this website. I don't need that anymore. I think you, we all know what, a, uh, what an HID lighting is now. So let me get back to my um, slide deck. Uh, I'm going to get back to the interrupting ratings and, and the rating discussion. Um, Voltage is IEEE rating, not IEC. Ah, uh, good, good. Uh, I, I know. Um, so all, all, all breakers are going to have a voltage rating. Okay, every breaker is going to have a, a voltage rating. This, this was my, my IEC breaker, right? This is listed to IEC uh, 60947. There's a voltage rating on that. So every circuit breaker is going to have a voltage rating, and it's a very critical part of its um, capabilities because you if you if you apply this circuit breaker outside of its voltage rating here's a good question for you if i have a circuit breaker that's a a, um, a, a 240 volt circuit breaker applied in a 600 volt system what's going to happen when i turn it on nothing it'll turn on what happens when i turn it off it'll turn off i can turn that breaker on and off i'm exceeding its voltage rating but the moment you start pulling current through it, the moment you call on it to interrupt the fault current, that's when you're misapplying it. That's when you can have an unintended rapid disassembly in the field. So some of these devices may look and work, seem like they're working perfectly fine until you have to have them do something. So uh, voltage is an important rating, interrupting rating. Uh, when you're using it as a switch, it has to be rated for that. Um, and there's requirements for voltage markings. The interrupting rating, we already said, if it's less than, if it's not marked, it's 5,000 amps. Supplementary protectors are not uh, required to be marked with an interrupting rating. Um, we, okay, so we're not going to talk about short circuit current ratings. 110.9 in the National Electrical Code tells me my interrupting rating has to be greater than the available fault current at that device, at its line terminals. So it's the maximum fault current that I can possibly stop the flow of current with. Uh, so I have to make sure that it uh, can can stop the flow of current at those high fault currents. So 110.9 device interrupting ring must be equal to or greater than the maximum available fault current. And the X to R ratio is important. And we talked about that. These devices are listed for a uh, an X to R ratio. And if your X to, if your power factor gets really bad, I believe it's 85%. I got to go back to those slides. Uh, I, well, they're coming up right now. So we're going to talk about that. So he, here's an example. Interrupting capacity, interrupting rating. At 240 volts, this circuit breaker can interrupt 65,000 amps of fault current. 
but at 480 volts, only 35,000 amps, and at 600 volts, only 18,000 amps. The higher the voltage, the lower the interrupting rating. So a common mistake. In fact, I had a guy send me an email who was frustrated with his inspector. And he goes, Tom, you're an IAEI member, International Association of Electrical Inspectors. You're a member of that organization. He says, you need to talk some sense into this electrical inspector. He goes, I have one of our circuit breakers that can interrupt 65,000 amps. And I've got uh, uh, only uh, 45,000 amps or 42,000 amps, whatever the, it was in the 40s. He goes, and I have a 65K breaker. And he says that my, uh, he red tagged and said, I have a problem with my installation. I violate 110.9. So, um, and I'm like, well, you know, and he gave me the inspector's name and I know a lot of electrical inspectors just from my involvement. And I knew exactly who it was. And I know that guy's a sharp guy. Most inspectors are because they do a lot of training. They do a lot of educational stuff, especially if they're a member of the IEI. So I called him and I said, um, I told him my sales guy, I said, I heard you got a problem. He goes, oh, Tom, he says, I just chuckle. He says, he goes, he's applying a breaker that's rated for 18,000 amps on 40 whatever thousand amps. And he says it's okay. Uh, or actually it was 35,000 amps because it was a 480 volt system. 600, that's Canada. He says it's only rated 35,000 amps. He's got 45 or whatever it was. He goes, and I red tagged it and, and he's arguing with me. So, and I said, well, you know, the breaker's rated 65,000 amps. He goes, at 240 volts, he says, but he says, it's at 480 volts. This is a 480 volt application. Oh my gosh. So I called the guy back up again. I said, hey, that breakers, where, where are you using at? He said, 480 volts. And I showed him the literature. It's only rated for 35. And there was dead silence on the phone. He goes, oh my gosh, I can't believe I missed that. But you get into those situations Voltage is critical with a circuit breaker. So regardless of what country you're in, voltage and interrupting ratings go together on circuit breakers, okay? Uh, regardless of the standards that you're using. Uh, that's just the interrupting rating of a fuse. Uh, we're not talking fuses, we're talking circuit breakers. So they can be rated in various increments between 5,000 and 200,000 amps. You can go to the catalogs. Um, oh yeah, I'm George, I'm gonna try to get terminations. Okay, so here we go. So there's your voltage. There's your different interruptings. Here's your fault current. And when we said, remember that, that asymmetrical, the X to R ratio will determine the peak of this. Remember that separate of between voltage and current. That power factor, that X to R ratio will determine the height of that peak and the slope of that fault current. And that's what makes it so hard to interrupt. My peak let through. Uh, my fuse or your current limiting circuit breaker will uh, will lower the peak, will, will not let that much current flow because it'll open so fast. So you're lowering the peak current and you're limiting the duration. Uh, that's, you know, so that's basically what your short circuit current looks like. You know, it's, it will have, we call this a, a DC decay, but that first half cycle over there is where a circuit breaker is going to start parting its contacts. <laughs> And the worse this X to R ratio is, if it's if if you have an X to R ratio that's worse than 6.6, .6, and that's like 80 some. Uh, no, I got. Uh, uh, wait, let's take a look. Hold on. I have that. We already we already went through all of this stuff. Um, I believe it's 6.6 .6 is the number that you're looking for. So it's a 15% power factor. That's where we test our breakers. So um, it 15%, it 36.87. So that is if your power factor is worse than 15%. So we try to pick the very worst case to stop that flow of current. Uh, and that's what you're getting there. So uh, and then and then sometimes you'll see limiters. So that's a limiter on a circuit breaker. That's for high fault currents. That'll It's there to protect that breaker. All right, and then we already talked about HID. So now let's talk about, we talked about the interrupting rating. We talked about the voltage rating. talked about the standard. We talked about the construction. Before I get into the um, electronic trip units, let's talk about 
the temperature reading. Now, the standard, if you look at any of these circuit breakers, yeah, here we go. So, MobiCam 1. Look at the 60, 75 degree C wire. So, can I put a 90 degree C wire on this lug? Yes, I can. I can't use the 90 degree C column. I can use the 75 degree C column because this is uh, from a temperature perspective. And you say, well, why is it? What's, what, what's the, uh, why the temperature limitation? Why can't I use a 90 degree C conductor at 90 degree C ampacity on this circuit breaker? Is it because uh, it will damage the circuit breaker itself inside. Is it because uh, uh, the 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 that that uh, that coil of wire inside there uh, is it? Does it have to do with something that's that's in here? Is it going to discolor my metal? Is it going to uh, no? Uh, when we put these things through the testing, I'm looking at temperature rise on all of these different parts. So the UL standards will tell me to put. Uh, thermocouples on different parts on the breaker and the terminations. And I have to maintain a temperature rise. We will test these breakers with a conductor installed on this on these terminals and the conductor itself helps with the temperature rise test. Because it's a copper mass, it's because it's an aluminum mass, whatever it is, it's a metal that is going to help sink the temperature away from that terminal. So to pass that test, for temperature rise, I am going to need a certain amount of copper landing on that lug for my circuit breaker. Now, when I um, when I when I I take this device and I um, and I land conductors, I go to my ampacity. I can use the ninety degree C column can use the 90 degree cell column to do my calculations, but I have, I can't exceed the 75 degree C ampacity because I need that amount of copper. Think about if I used, if I went to 310. Dot, let's go to 310.16 in the code. Table 310.16. Um, Just looking, yeah. So I go to 310.16 and I take a, um, I'm trying to figure out what would be good here. Um, I'm trying to figure out would be good here. Yeah, let's say, uh, 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 I don't know, I'm, I'm just pick a number of it. The difference between a 75 degree C and a 90 degree C column is what I'm looking for. I got 130 amps that I could put on, on, a, on a number one conductor a one AW American wire gauge, one gauge wire, I can put 130 amps on that in the 75 degree column, but I can put 145 in the 90 degree C column. Now, if I put that conductor on, if, if I'm using the 90 degree C conductor, I would, I could I'm trying to, let's say that I'm using a, a number one, I'm putting more current through that conductor. I'm using it at its 90 degree ampacity. So I'm, I've, I can put up to 145 amps through that conductor. That means I can, uh, I, I will have a smaller conductor to handle that load. Hopefully, I hope I'm, 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 I'm trying to, it, I'm trying to explain it correctly or, or make it easy to understand. I can use a smaller conductor if I use the 90 degree C. If I put it this way, if I have 140 amps of current, if I'm using the 75 degree, I'm using a one aught, a larger conductor. If I'm using the 90 degree C, I'm using a number one. That, that's an easy way to look at this, right? Now, if I have 140, if I'm using, if I have 145 amp load, if I use the 75 degree C column, I have to bump the size up to a one aught. If I use the 90 degree C, I'm using a number one. A number one is a smaller amount of copper than a one aught. 
my breaker would need you to use a one aught conductor because I need that larger conductor for 150 amps. I need that copper on my lug to wick off that temperature. So it's about temperature rise and passing the temperature rise test in UL489. So that's why I need to, and, and these, can, these terminals are rated that way. It's hard to find, now I might find a terminal block. Oh, it's in there. Uh, I might find a terminal block that's rated at 90 degrees C, but you're not going to find a fuse switch or a circuit breaker that can handle 90 degrees C conductors used at 90 degrees C ampacity. I can still land a 90 degrees C conductor on this because the 90 degrees C is talking about the insulation that's on a copper or aluminum conductor. I just can't use it at its 90 degrees C opacity because then that would make a smaller conductor for the application and I need more copper. So it's about heat, okay? Um, it's all about heat. There's torque. Now this is the small, this is the small miniature circuit breaker that you would see in a residential home. Uh, there's torque on the side. We had the question about torque. We had uh, 60, 75 degrees C wire used only in listed enclosures. Um, 10,000 amp interrupting rating. It even gives you a little uh, how much to strip off of it. You've got your voltage ratings uh, on it. Look at this. Look at me. 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 Right There's your uh, 10,000 amps. There's your, your wire. There's your torque. Uh, you'll notice too, you'll, you'll look at the, look at these, uh, uh, the rivets. These are rivets. These, you're not going to take these apart and put it back together again. That's for daggone shore. Right, there's your voltage ratings. We already looked at the front switch duty. All right, so, and, and there's your line and load marking. So, the limited, there's a limitation. Now, the other thing you got to think about too, the other thing is um, you have your temperature, your 90 and 75 degrees C. But what about a fully rated system? meaning 100% rated, meaning this is a, remember, this is a, <laughs> that's a 20 amp breaker, right? Whenever I do my load calculations as part of my national electrical code, right? I will calculate the load and what do I do for my continuous loads? What's my multiplier? I take my non-continuous load, Let's say that I have uh, a heater that's only going to be running for 20, 30 minutes at a time. Like I got a heater under my desk. I have a heater that's going to run 20, 30%, so it's a non-continuous load. And then I have lights. My lights are on all day. That's a continuous load, four hours or more, right? I think it's four hours. Um, what I would do when I, when I do my load calculation, I take my non-continuous plus 1.25, 125% of my continuous. What is one divided by 1.25? One over 0 0.8, 80%. So when I take a load, current, <clears throat> and I multiply it by 1.25 for continuous, rating. That's what we call 80% rated because it's a continuous current flowing through this breaker. I can only handle 80% of a continuous current flowing through this breaker. It's 80%. You're right, Sharish. So if this is a 20 amp breaker, continuously flowing through a 20 amp breaker, 0.8 times 20 is 16 amps. So this breaker can handle 16 amps continuously, 80%. And that's why in the code we do 1.25 times continuous current. Now, we do sell breakers that are 100% rated, meaning it says 20 amps on the handle, I can handle 20 amps continuously. But 
Remember, what's, what is the circuit breaker's worst enemy? It's not the fuse. It is heat. Okay? When I take continuous current through this device, I'm going to generate heat. So when you look at the catalogs for continuous current, uh, a continuous current rated device, and I have, um, I'm just going to do a search on my hard drive. And while it's searching, oh, geez, oh, me. Technical presentations. Uh, test, technical, test, uh, there, there's um, uh, continuous rated, continuous rated, basics, 100% rated. So I have, a, I have a slide deck on 80% versus 100%. So let's take a look at it. Let me show you something. Me and um, PPT tight. All right. So this is an 80% versus 100% rated circuit breaker. And uh, uh, this breaker right here is 80%. There's no, uh, it's not labeled as 100% as rated. But I'll tell you what this means. 100% rated, boy, it's, it's 714. Jeez, I oh mean, I'm going forever. 100% rated circuit breaker marked as useless. 100% of its rated shall be tested as described in 7143 using one of the following options. The smallest enclosure, because remember, it's about heat, Scott. It's about heat. Uh, no, it won't trip at 17 amps. Remember, I, I'm not worried about tripping at 17 amps. It's still going to be a 20 amp breaker. It's going to trip up there at 20 amps. But I'm not worried about taking the fault off or taking a, a load off. It's still going to be a 20 amp breaker and it's long time pickup is going to be up at 20 amps. But I'm more worried about the amount of heat that I'm generating passing through this device. So 100% rated breaker shall be tested in the smallest enclosure or cubicle which it is intended. Why would I worry about the size of the enclosure for this breaker running at 100%? It's for heat. It has nothing to do with whether or not it's going to trip at 80%. It won't trip at 80%. It's going to trip at 20 amps when you exceed 20 amps. But I can't put 20 amps through it continuously because it's about the heat, right? So temperature rise, where connections are made, the external bus bars, when bus bars are used or on a wire. So uh, it's uh, talking about the temperature rise, shall not exceed 60 degrees C. If marked in accordance with 91214, the marking shall be permitted to indicate only specific current rating. So I'm worried about the temperature rise on these terminals. For the 100% rated test, a circuit breaker shall be connected with a copper bus bars. So if I have a panel board enclosure that has an aluminum bus, it cannot possibly be 100% rated. Why? Because it has to have a copper bus. And I'll tell you, and look, it says, unless the circuit breaker is marked to indicate otherwise, the bus bars shall have a cross section of 100 amp inch squared for ratings less than 1600 amps. For ratings 1600 amps and higher, the bus bar shall be in accordance with, the, with a table. Okay, so, and why do I worry about the size and of, the, of the bus bar? It's about the heat. I got to get the heat off of this device. I'm worried about temperature rise. That's its enemy is temperature rise. So I, I will set this breaker up. It talks about how it shall be marked suitable for continuous operation at 100% of rating only if used in a circuit breaker enclosure. So the enclosure matters. And some of my panel boards will not accept 100% rated circuit breaker. So you don't screw this up because if, you, if you're anticipating using 100% rated, why would I do that? Because I can put 20 amps through this 20 amp breaker and not 80%. And if I can put 20 amps through this breaker, then if, if, if my load is 20 amps and I did 80%, it's a continuous load. 1.25 times 20 is 25 amps. I'd have to go up to a bigger breaker, okay? I either use a 25 amp breaker or a 30 amp breaker. So I'm a higher amp rated breaker, more expensive. The only reason I'm gonna do 100% rated stuff is because I wanna save money in the overcurrent protection device. And when you save money, you got to cross your T's and dodge your I's, right, buddy? So this is telling you only when it's in a specific enclosure, right? So there's your uh, mark for 100%. Other, otherwise, it's 80%. So you have special markings, 100% continuous marking, unless otherwise marked uh, a breaker uh, is 80% of its rating. So 20 is not going to be listed for 20. And you have to meet these special conditions 
to use a 100% rated breaker. And this is our catalog number. Look, I have um, some of these breakers. Some of these breakers, look, it, note three says 100% rated. So a CKD, a CHKD is rated for 100%, but these others are not. A DK breaker, a KDB or a KD breaker is not 100% rated, but a CKD is, okay? Now, now it gets, the, the plot gets even better. Now let's go to the panel board. Look what the panel board says. 100% uh, rated circuit breaker requires copper bus. We saw that in the standard. And it's not available in types 12, 4, and 4X enclosures. So I can have a circuit breaker 100% rated, but I may not be able to fit, fit it in the panel board that I have installed. So remember, it's a complete solution. Okay? And if I go into, um, uh, look at this. Okay, so this is, again, my panel board solutions, right? And look what it says down here at the bottom. 100% rated breaker requires copper bus. The K and N frame breakers require density rated copper bus, a special copper bus. And again, it's not available in a type 12 404 X enclosure. So if you screw up, it's not as simple as saying, well, oh, I'll just go buy a different breaker. No, you might have to change the panel board out, okay? All right, so it is 7.20. Gosh, oh, Ned, it flew. Two hours flew, five, six, seven. It's an hour and 20 minutes. Um, and I covered, what let's think about it. I didn't cover electronic trip units. Here's what I'll do. I'm going to do that at a different date. And what I might do is try to get uh, one of my design engineers on with me if I can to talk about electronic trip units. Uh, maybe I'll try Jim Legree. I don't know. Or uh, or or I'll get uh, Lou Grayhor. Uh, I'll get somebody. I'll try to get a partner when I when we start talking about um, about uh, about uh, electronic trip units. But we covered the we covered the workhorse. We covered the, the the thermomagnetic circuit breaker. We talked about how the trip curve is developed. We talked about the arc shoots, how we stop the flow of current. We showed you there are different ways to do, to skin that cat. Um, Q, uh, James, break down cubicle space. We don't have time for that. I will, uh, I will, let me just look at some of the questions. Interesting, I'll see if Bidman changes uh, my bus material. Scott Taylor, excellent. For aluminum to copper when I select 100%. Yeah, check it out, Scott. Check that out. Will it trip at 17 amps? It will not trip at 17 amps. It's still going to be a 20 amp breaker. Does grounding determine dual voltage rating? Does grounding determine dual voltage rating? Yes. So dual voltage rating. When we say dual voltage, the slash rating, right? So remember, the code in Article 240 tells us that a circuit breaker has to has to have a rating, a voltage rating. The bigger number has to be greater than the line to line. The lower number has to be greater than the line to neutral. If I have an ungrounded system, straight rated breakers across the board. I don't have a line. I don't have a neutral. I don't have a. I, I don't have that. So straight rated uh, voltages uh, breakers uh, in those types of applications. Um, and, and you can't, like, for example, if I have a 120-volt circuit breaker, 120 volts, straight-rated circuit breaker. Uh, I don't have an AFCI breaker. Uh, I don't have an AFCI breaker that has a label on it. I got a pigtail. I got a see-through. And this is slash rated. That's if I had a 120 volt sla a 120 volt rated breaker, put it in my residential panel board and I panel board and I put a handle tie across, I would be a misapplication because now I have a handle tie. I have 240 volts between those tied breakers, and it's only rated 120 line to neutral voltage. So grounding Sharish uh, does play a role. Hopefully, I got your your cover, George, on the temperature uh, rating. And that discussion, if not, please uh, leave me a note and we will cover that when we go over the electronic trip units. We can flow back. Uh, more robust than the SWD? I don't believe so, Joe Bellantoni. 
Uh, well, it could be. I mean, they're switch duty. The contacts are probably different. They're, you know, I don't even know if he's still on, uh, but uh, the contacts will probably be rated a different material. So that's really where the where the workhorse work is. Um, torque labeled. Torque is labeled. Sixty seventy five. Can we download this session, Sharish? It's only on YouTube. So subscribe to my channel, buddy. You got to be subscribed and check out my website, thomasdimitrovich.com. Um, subscribe there. I will. I'm going to start a newsletter. I'm going to start letting you guys and gals know. Uh, check out the schedule on thomasdimitrovich.com. Uh, that's going to help you. Um, and remember, electrical worker training, www.eaton.com slash electrical worker training and use Eaton Tech Talk, all one word. Thanks, George. Uh, thanks, Richard. I'm going to recommend this to our engineers and lead electricians. Thank you, Richard. Subscribe to the channel, buddy. Um, very useful. I'm grateful. and appreciated. Thank you, David, Steve Froming. Please don't forget to call, respond to the email. Oh, you sent me an email, Steve. I'm going to take a look. And I recall, oh, that's right. Oh, man. I will call you, uh, Mr. Uh, man, dadgummit. Jeez, Steve, I'm sorry, buddy. I, I remembered your email and I was going to call you. I saw it over the weekend. I was going to call you on Saturday, I think it was, but then I got tied up. <sighs> Scott, uh, James Smith, Scott Taylor. Everybody, thank you for dialing in. Thanks for, uh, for, for hanging in there for over two hours. Um, remember, just bookmark my uh, book. Go, to, go out to my YouTube channel. And uh, actually, I stream this on all three platforms. Um, so, and, and he's watching on LinkedIn. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep that up. Check out my YouTube channel so you can go back and look at this and pause it back up. All that good stuff. If you have questions, send me an email. Uh, you can you can even uh, subscribe to my my web web page too because I, I'm, I'm gonna have fun on the web. That's my first time I ever had thomasdimitrovich.com. I've got my own domain. Urgh, yes. All right, everybody. I'm going to sign off. Uh, it's done good, not ungood. Excellent, yes, Mr. Curran. Thank you, and David Rodriguez. Thank you. The city of joy. Thank you. Uh, and in Sorab, thank you for for handing in there. Jesus, watching here from the Philippines. Oh yes, Philippines. There's 50, 60. Most of these circuit breakers are listed. 50, 60 hertz, um, and it does. It hurts. Uh, look, it says uh, 60, 75, 40 degrees C. Well, where's it at? Uh, 50, 60 hertz. Now I'll tell you when you run into trouble is when you get into 400 hertz. We'll talk about that on the next program. So uh, 400 hertz, uh, it, it, you have to do some derating, and I will uh, specifically address uh, the 400 hertz application. Where do you see 400 hertz? You see 400 hertz in aircraft, uh, military type of stuff. Uh, 50, 60, most of this stuff can handle 50 hertz or 60 hertz. Uh, and I'll, we'll have a frequency discussion uh, on the next call. So that's why you got to subscribe and you've got to keep coming back on a plane. The City of Joy knows all about that plane. So Nelson, Amy Nelson, thank you very much. So Rob, Richard Curran, David Rodriguez, everybody out there, thank you for, for tuning in. Thanks for hanging in there. And I will be loading this up to my, think about this. I got a YouTube site. I stream to my LinkedIn and my Facebook. I've got thomasdimitrovich.com and I have a podcast where I take all of this material and I put it over to the podcast and you can listen to it while you drive or while you're working. You can whistle while you work. You can listen to it while you work and we can, uh, we can uh, just learn stuff together. All right. All right. We'll, and we'll cover electronic trip units next time. Thanks everybody. Thanks for what you do for the electrical industry. Thanks for what you do for electrical safety. Please stay safe and God bless you and please stay healthy. Until next time, um, which will be Tuesday, we're going to be talking about dimmer switches and the ones you can operate from your phone. Check out the schedule. All right, everybody. Thank you very much. Take care. Stay safe. God bless. All that jazz. I'm going to sign off. Alrighty, we're going to shut this down and I'm going upstairs. All right.